Montenegro is NATO's newest member. Russia is furious that the alliance now appears to have its head turned further east. Could that push relations with its old foe to the brink? This is Roundtable with me, David Foster. Small but strategic with a complicated past and present, Montenegro, once bombed by NATO, is now part of it. Its membership, the last piece of the NATO jigsaw along the northern Mediterranean, where it was once a long-time ally of Russia, it is now in danger of becoming some kind of enemy. Some worry that an east-west power struggle could destabilize the region. For the first time in a decade, NATO has grown. Its newest addition in a tiny country in the Balkans with a population of just over 600,000 people. I'm Dana Lewis and I've come here to Montenegro to find out why it's just become the 29th member of NATO. It's a decision that's divided the nation, it has enraged Russia, and it's put this small country at the center of a geopolitical tug of war between East and West. Ninety minutes drive from Montenegro's capital of Podgorica, Montenegro's army is in action. Troops now fly the NATO flag and carry out simulated mountaintop assault with other Western countries like Austria. Why does NATO want Montenegro in its alliance? The fact is this is a tiny army, only 2,000 soldiers. But it paves the road for other countries to potentially join NATO, and its membership sends a very strong message to Russia. By signing up Montenegro to the NATO alliance, it now strategically controls the entire northern shore of the Mediterranean, from Portugal to the Syrian border. And its ports will no longer welcome Russian warships. Why do you think Russia sees NATO as a threat, and what is your message to them? And I'm pretty sure our accession to NATO is in the best interest of Russia, if their interest is peace and stability in the region, so... If? Yeah. So we will see. Russia's annexation of Crimea, its intervention in Ukraine and Georgia, and military threats to NATO countries in the Baltics helped push Montenegro into NATO's arms. I don't believe we have ever been the primary target of Russian politics in the region. We are only one piece of the puzzle. I believe that uh, as any big power, Russia is trying to challenge the international liberal order. How far was Russia willing to go to block the NATO ascension? Montenegro claims Russia directed a coup plot against the government. Milan Konevich is an opposition party leader and one of those indicted. He says the government created the coup to sway support for NATO and reinforce resentment of Russia. To je najveća glupost. Dakle, ja nisam nikakav ruski agent, ja sam crnogorski političar koji se zalaže za najbolje moguće odnose sa Rusijom jer se radi o našem istorijskom i tradicionalnom Just 18 years ago, NATO bombed Montenegro, but the beginning of its campaign to free Kosovo.
Montenegro has mixed memories of NATO. In 1999, this was an underground warplane hangar. NATO bombed it in the war. 27 planes were destroyed. Today, it houses one and a half million liters of wine. Montenegro exports $16 million of wine per year. Most of that goes to Russia. But since it joined NATO, Moscow banned all wine imports from the country. Its beaches have been targeted too. Russia's foreign ministry has warned Russian tourists against going to Montenegro. Russia clearly sees NATO's expansion into Montenegro as a loss of influence, power and pride. The question is, will NATO's presence here long term be a stabilizing factor as it has been in other parts of Europe since World War II? Or is this dangerous tinkering in Eastern Europe? Because another conflict in the Balkans could drag NATO into a war it never counted on. So is this NATO expansion a struggle simply against Russia for power? Joining me at the roundtable today from New York is Andriy Dobryansky, an expert in Ukrainian political affairs. He rejects the idea that NATO expansion threatens Russia in any way. In the studio, we have John Lachlan from the Institute of Democracy and Cooperation. He believes that NATO has ambitions for the entire Balkan Peninsula. To my right, Samir Puri from King's College London. He was a ceasefire monitor in Ukraine and Marcus Papadopoulos, immediately to my left, editor of UK political magazine Politics First. He says most people in Montenegro just didn't want to join NATO. Finally, we have five today. Sir Adam Thompson, who until last year worked at NATO, he says we shouldn't fall prey to Russian propaganda. Thank you all of you uh, for joining us on the round table. Sir Adam, first of all, give me an example in your opinion of where NATO has been a success in the last 25 years, where it's fulfilled its role. Uh, I think since the end of the Cold War, David, NATO's done two uh, remarkable things. One is contributing to stability in Eastern Europe as it emerged from the Soviet Empire. And the other is its enduring role of preventing us all from fighting each other. Uh, it makes uh, Europe more cohesive uh, in that all-important security sphere. Well, I'm sure we will get to examples such as the, the Balkans and, and Libya a little bit later in the program. But let me throw that out to, to those of you who believe that NATO's intentions in this area are not necessarily that honorable. Well, the intentions are one thing. I think the record speaks for itself. I, I don't agree that NATO has contributed to stability. I think it's contributed to terrible instability. Let's not forget NATO attacked Yugoslavia in 1999, an illegal war, <clears throat> a criminal war in the terms of the Nuremberg uh, uh, jurisprudence and it then uh, committed the same crime in 2011 when it attacked Libya. It had no uh, right uh, to promote regime change in Libya any more than it had a right to attack Yugoslavia and these are the only operations apart from the uh, operation in Afghanistan which is an abject failure and which has lasted now longer than the two world wars combined that NATO has uh, conducted, and both of them have led to terrible instability. But what do you have We've if you don't have NATO? Massive immigration now coming, from, coming through Libya, which is destabilizing Europe and is very bad for Europe. And of course, the attack on Yugoslavia similarly uh, uh, only added uh, fuel to the fire of, of that the sorry country. The question is what would replace it, because it, the, Europe cannot operate, or North Atlantic cannot operate necessarily in a vacuum. We have to establish something which is very, very important. NATO is an offensive criminal, murderous organization that has destabilized not just Europe, the Balkans and Eastern Europe, but has also destabilized Libya. It is NATO via America who played the leading role in the destruction of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia and then the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. And today, NATO is on Russia's western borders, which is a real, real threat to not just peace in Europe, well, but to global peace. For that peace. very reason, let's bring in Andrei Dobryansky in New York. Uh, Ukraine's parliament recently mm. voted uh, once again to say it would like at some point in the future uh, to join NATO. Stabilizing force or destabilizing? Well, I'd like to agree with the, uh, my first colleague uh, who pointed out the incredible stabilizing 
uh, nature of NATO, the fact that all of these countries in Europe, which have warred for centuries, it's not just the last 25 years, but centuries uh, of war, are now joined into a military alliance uh, that uh, prevents conflicts from uh, erupting in Europe. Uh, I well, but let, hear, let me just sorry, uh, I'm going to butt in here. That, that could however, be because we have uh, a, a European uh, alliance that ties them together economically rather than militarily, the European Union. No, uh, having a military alliance changes drastically the relationship between countries. Uh, uh, economic uh, alliances have been forged throughout centuries, but military alliances, the likes of NATO, have never existed uh, on Earth. <laughs> And uh, we can see the stabilizing effect of it, uh, again, on the continent of Europe, where wars have been fought for centuries, uh, slaughtering uh, more than half of its population throughout the, uh, throughout the century. So uh, the fact that a military alliance exists today where major powers are aligned together and would never raise the threat of violence against each other can only be a stabilizing uh, force throughout uh, I, both Europe and the world. I'm going to bring in Samir at this point because you haven't had that chance so far. Then it's entirely up to you to sort of throw it around as you would wish. The question I put was, without NATO, what? Uh, we haven't actually got a proper answer for it. You just said, said you what terrible thing you thought NATO was. But Europe without NATO. Well, I think the two contending views we've just heard sort of imbue NATO with the sense that it is some kind of autonomous actor uh, acting purely in the basis of its own interests. It's a multilateral organisation. It represents the sum total of the will of its member states. And the question, of course, is what if not NATO? Well, those member states would find other mechanisms, other forums through which to try to achieve security, try to bind Europe into something mm. that is actually much more stable than has been the case through centuries of European history. I would agree with the first and the last speaker just now. We cannot take NATO's existence for granted and just wish it away. Kick it off. Well, I, I mean, I would just like to pick up on that. Um, America is the de facto leader of NATO, and that's indisputable. And America, for the last 25 years or so, has been using NATO to uh, cement and to enhance its global supremacy. And let's just have a look at who NATO has worked with in the last few years. In, during the Kosovo War, it worked hand in hand with the Kosovo Liberation Army, an organization <coughs> which is part of an organized crime network in the Balkans, run by Hashim Tashi, who's now the president of Kosovo. He's one of the biggest organized crime leaders um, in modern day Europe. Let's have a look who NATO worked with in Libya, uh, Islamist terrorists <coughs> to overthrow the legitimate government of Colonel Gaddafi. If we take Ukraine, NATO has been working with neo-fascist groups, neo-Nazi groups, groups who are open in their praise of the Holocaust and who are open in their praise of the other Nazi atrocities that uh, the Germans committed during their occupation of Ukraine. Go back to New York in a minute, but I think you want to say something. Well, I think you have to unpack quite a lot of that. First of all, the world is not a nice place. NATO in Afghanistan, for example, isn't always dealing with saints. But it is stabilizing. Uh, the alternative, the question you've been trying to ask, David, of what if not NATO after the end of the Cold War, uh, I'm almost certain would have been much more bloodshed right across Europe. NATO, you may remember, was a reluctant participant in the Balkans wars. NATO, you might recall, actually had Security Council authorization for its actions in 2011 in Libya. So it didn't uh, have, it didn't, you, it didn't you have need, authorization you need to, for regime change. Uh, accept that there are some shades of But they of exceeded gray their here. mandate in well, Libya. What if NATO expands? Will it expand? Can it continue to exist? And let's go to uh, Andre in New York because of your Ukrainian connections. And I mentioned the fact that the parliament there had voted in favour once again of, of saying, yes, we'd love to be a member of NATO. How strongly is the feeling there that uh, Ukraine's uh, integrity, its sovereignty, depends on becoming a, a, a member of NATO? I think you need to point at the, uh, look back to what happened in Bucharest in 2008 uh, when NATO uh, declined to give membership to both Ukraine and Georgia, but uh, with a promise of future membership. The situation in Ukraine has completely changed around since that time, especially in the civil society sector with the Revolution of Dignity in 2013 and 14. However, today, Ukraine is a country that has the largest army in Europe the largest army with any combat uh, experience in Europe, uh, fighting an active war uh, on its own territory from a foreign invader. Uh, for NATO not to have this as part of them uh, would be 
both catastrophic to both NATO and Ukraine. Uh, it's a mutual alliance based on uh, okay. mutual. Uh, so you believe it should uh, expand and it should of, include uh, Ukraine. sovereignty, territorial integrity. Samir, will it expand? Well, I mean, the first thing I, I, want to I believe that yeah. that NATO's future does include Ukraine. So uh, the first thing I want to say is, I mean, I spent a year in East Ukraine monitoring the ceasefire not long after MH17 was brought down, right up until uh, well after the Minsk II agreement. And I mean, the situation in Ukraine is very dire. It's fundamentally changed the nature of this entire debate. And I would certainly again take issue with uh, both of the contributions we've heard, which are basically, frankly, Moscow mouthpiece style perspectives which is to say that the significance of NATO changes as the wider geopolitics change. It's not a singular entity that from 1991, from 1948, has retained its same significance. After 2014 and the war in Ukraine, the significance of NATO has changed completely in the sense that there are going to be many more Eastern European states and Central European states wanting to effectively bandwagon with NATO to ensure themselves against Russian <coughs> interference. And what are the dangers of uh, NATO well, expansion? Well, can, can I just pick up on that? You, you said just now that... Uh, myself and John are just mouthpieces for Moscow. Well, perhaps you might want to go to Serbia and talk to people there who endured a murderous bombing campaign for months upon months in 1999 when NATO dropped depleted uranium shells in that country, causing a massive increase in cancer rates. Do you know how many people have died in Serbia since 1999 as a result of this increase in cancer rates? I think could that's you, preposterous. Could you, could you take that and off, off air and just talk about what we're yes, talking about right but now? but if I can also talk, uh, refer to the guest in uh, New York, he referred to the revolution in, uh, in Ukraine <coughs> as a revolution of dignity. A, pr an, a democratically elected president, Viktor Yanukovych, was overthrown in February 2014 by the Americans and the European Union. Way, so His election be noted. Was, was, was accepted and recognized by the United States and the European This isn't what we're talking Union. about at the moment. We are well, talking about the dangers, in your opinion, of NATO <coughs> but expansion. But it's very important to establish just what, what NATO is. What do you believe is. will happen if NATO expands? I do not and, believe. Do you think it will? I do not believe that NATO will expand into Ukraine. That is not what the people of Ukraine want. And also, as well, Russia cannot countenance that. That it would well, be an extremely to serious right threat now, but... to Russia. And we have to remember that Ukraine is an artificially created country. There is no such thing as a Ukrainian race. The Russians, the wow. Russians and the Ukrainians, they are the same people. East. So Slavs. you are just denying okay, an entire okay, look, people this is the largest country in all of Europe. Program. Thank you it's very much for both people. of those strongly held. <laughs> views, but I'm going to go to <laughs> Sir Adam here now. When we're talking about, uh, Marcus Papadopoulos says he doesn't think NATO will expand. And let me quote some of the things written by the number two military commander at NATO last year, Sir Richard Shiriff. He wrote a fictional account of, of war, but he also gave an interview in which he said, the really scary thing about Trump is what he said about not necessarily coming to country's aids if a NATO member is attacked. The whole principle rests on this. So without US support, and we, it's it's not in any way a given at the moment, fully given. Um, the whole thing can't exist as a proper entity, surely. NATO has always been driven by a principle of freedom of association. Uh, it isn't an organization that has ever coerced anybody to join it. Uh, membership is free, but members also have to bring something to the table. I believe that NATO will continue to remain open to future members, and I think future members will join. But the process I suppose, I suppose is not necessarily going be, to be you know, rapid. I mean, what, what does Montenegro bring to the table? It, it, it's tiny. It is simply strategic. It's preventing Russia from getting access to Mediterranean coastlines. And it's sure. keeping Serbia down in the Balkans as well. well what does Montenegro bring Well, it's to the fanciful table? to say Montenegro is keeping Serbia down, but the... It's a way of weakening at, Serbia The, the accession Balkans. of Montenegro to NATO is... Uh, with all due respect to those who will disagree, stabilizing for the Balkans. It keeps open the prospect of belonging to the Euro-Atlantic community, both security and economically, for all Balkans countries. And it, it, it's very odd from the point of view of my Western members to hear Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, 
saying that Montenegro's accession to NATO is a provocation. How could that possibly be a problem for Russia? But militarily, but I, it doesn't bring very much at all. And it, it, it is strategic. That's simply all it is. It's just a political uh, piece of nonsense. Uh, I think one of the biggest problems, which makes the, one of the things that worries me most about our own situation in the West, is this terrible blindness we have towards the way that our policy decisions are seen by others. Uh, we've already mentioned NATO's wars of aggression. Uh, we know that NATO has attacked uh, both Yugoslavia and Libya. We know that NATO and its member countries want to put in place a missile shield which the Russians consider to be a strategic threat. We have to have some sense in diplomacy, you're a diplomat, of how our actions appear to our adversaries and rivals. And this idea that after 25 years of attacks, whether under the label of NATO or not, because of course the Iraq war was waged by NATO members, the idea that this is not perceived as aggressive the idea that we cannot see how we are seen from the outside. Can, Can I, I jump in there? I'm really going to New York because okay. Andrew's got up very early in the morning to, yeah. to talk to us and uh, he keeps nodding why, his head or why, shaking why his why head. Why is there no discussion of, of, of Russia's aggression right now, of, of seven different conflict zones it's actively involved in outside of its own borders and stating that our allies are really the problem? Uh, our, our, my colleague made a very good point about NATO promoting freedom of association. <clears throat> it's not just the countries of NATO that are involved in all these conflicts around the world. One should also realize that there are member, uh, there are NATO partner nations such as Georgia and Ukraine. Ukraine, for one, has been involved with NATO, deploying side by side with NATO troops since 1996. Georgia, for one, has lost the most uh, uh, most soldiers of any member partner country in Afghanistan than any uh, member nation that has participated in that conflict. Okay. So Therefore, there are already partner nations who are not aligned with NATO in the military alliance who are already sacrificing their lives. It, 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 so, so it why is a are point we well made. Sorry, the, Andre, the it, it, other it is a point well made as opposed to our member allies. Andre in the, by Andre in New York that. Um, People feel threatened sometimes by things that they don't really understand. And, and therefore, it, the Russians might feel threatened about the fact that NATO appears to be mm. expanding, even if there is no real reason to do so. It's a very important point to take into consideration how your actions come across to others, the inadvertent consequences. And no lesser a figure than Robert Gates, former defense secretary, in his autobiography, opines that maybe some of the initial NATO expansions in the late 90s were a bit premature in terms of not seeking a degree of Russian, maybe an acquiescence but at least awareness that it was going to happen well in advance. That said, Russian foreign policy and security policy in the last two to three years has exploited pretexts very effectively. And that means the ability to be able to interpret and reinterpret other people's actions to justify their own actions. Well, I mean, and then we could go back to the, the Cold War. We could go back to 1956. We could go back to the uh, actions of the, mm. the Warsaw Pact countries in that time and how those actions were perceived by, by the other side. In, 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 that, in that period, there was a, an intense ideological confrontation between East and West, between communism and capitalism, between dictatorship and tyranny. And yet, uh, even in the dark days of the Cold War, uh, Washington and Moscow were constantly putting out feelers uh, to try to overcome this ideological confrontation and to make the world a self a place. It's absolutely incredible to me that 25 years after the end of the Soviet dictatorship, uh, uh, leaders, particularly in America, seem to be trying to do the very opposite and seem to be trying to curry uh, conflict and, and encourage well, conflict perhaps with the Russians Moscow. are frightened about the well, fact that um, they believe that NATO countries said we would not expand mm -hmm. after the Cold War. They believe a promise was made and it's not been kept. That is a very, very important point. In 1990, uh, the Americans, in return for the Soviet Union consenting to West Germany and East Germany reuniting, gave Mikhail Gorbachev a verbal guarantee that NATO would not expand eastwards beyond Germany's borders. Now, that assurance was given to Gorbachev. That was part and it is, of the guarantee and it is, and about it is also, East Germany, and it is also not all confirmed. of okay, so And it is also confirmed in James Baker's memoirs. Is, is it actions like uh, the Russians going into Crimea, take, annexing Crimea, that make NATO worried or necessary? Yeah, of course. Samir said uh, much earlier in this conversation that the annexation of Crimea, the first annexation illegally of territory 
in, since the Second World War and the subsequent <coughs> Russian intervention in eastern Ukraine has transformed the situation. And I've seen for myself at NATO how that organization's thinking has been transformed top to bottom, side to side. There is no aspect of NATO's current work that is not affected by this sense that borders have been violated. But borders have been violated. May I, may I just make one other point? May, though. May Sorry, I also add, add that there's been a period of uh, over I just want years to say that I do agree NATO has with not John responded. on one point, maybe only one point. But he is absolutely right that we do need to be aware of the impact of our actions. And NATO's expansion is genuinely alarming to Russians. I know that from the Russian members of the European Leadership Network. So uh, there is a problem, but that problem needs a balanced conversation uh, that recognizes that no one is a saint in the modern world that Russia's behavior has been as alarming to NATO members as NATO's behavior has been to Russia. Well, yeah, if that, the temperature is going up, can it be brought down again? Yeah, I mean, we're also fixing on NATO. There's, of course, the OSCE That's what this program's well, about. The Organization <laughs> for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which it provides a diplomatic forum for Russia and for the Western European and American countries as well, all to engage. It sits alongside NATO as well, and I think we forget about that. If the Russians Maybe. are very serious in terms of dialogue, then there is also another avenue through which they can extend uh, the olive branch. Okay, well. so maybe it is time to bring everybody together in a different way, and we have diplomats. Well, the Russians want nothing thinkers. more than that. They are, they're begging for it. Empathy They've been asking for it. Let's say goodbye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you all very much indeed for coming here, and thank you, Andrei Dobransky, in New York. So we're talking east, we're talking west. I think it's agreed there should be somewhere in the middle. The struggle for power and influence, well, we know it's always existed, and part of the battle stopping antagonism. I think we are agreed becoming aggression. That's what we've been talking about. This has been Roundtable. From me, David Foster, and the rest of the team, thank you very much for watching. See you next time. Bye-bye.